archaeology. Uh, my name is Dr. Toby Martin. I'm a departmental lecturer in this department, um, and I've been a part-time <coughs> tutor here for some time. Um, I specialise in early medieval archaeology, which is the period after the Romans and before the Normans, that sort of five, six hundred years or so of mysterious centuries. Um, and I also specialise in dress and jewellery, um, so objects like this sort of buckles and brooches and that sort of thing. Um, my topic for today, though, is what is archaeology? Um, something that I hope I'll be able to tell you. Um, but really it's about why is archaeology a uniquely valuable and rewarding subject to study, um, particularly as a mature student or a lifelong learner. I think archaeology is a much bigger subject than a lot of people often think, um, and it can sometimes lead in quite unexpected directions. So I want to hopefully inspire you in all the different things that we as archaeologists do. But first, what do archaeologists, what is archaeology not? It's not about dinosaurs. <laughs> a more common misconception than you, than you might think, um, so I'm afraid no dinosaurs. You can leave now if you, if you like, if that's, <laughs> that's enough for you. Um, the other thing in archaeology is not all whips and fedoras. Um, yes. It's not all about adventures and brawls. Um, we are a serious intellectual endeavour most of the time. and We prefer our archaeologists to be in the laboratory, the excavation trench or the classroom, um, or perhaps even the library. Um, so less of that and more of, more of this. Now, I think it's useful to just ask some very basic questions to flesh out this idea of what archaeology is. And to do that, I'm going to ask... What is archaeology? Where, how, and why archaeology? So what do we look at as archaeologists? What are we interested in? Where do we work? Where does archaeology happen? How do we produce all this knowledge about the past? And also, why do we bother? Why is it interesting? And why is it important to study archaeology? Fundamentally, Archaeology is about materials. It's about the physical traces of the past. That's the fundamental um, thing that we study as archaeologists. And this goes from the very, very small to the very, very big. So we're interested in atoms, molecules, DNA, biological molecules. We're interested in different isotopes of carbon. That's how we date things. There's a common refrain that archaeology is rubbish. <laughs> and there really is nothing else that archaeologists would prefer to rummage through than someone else's bins, <laughs> preferably if they're very, very old. Um, and indeed, this is the bulk of what archaeologists look at. It's essentially waste materials. Bits of broken pot, bits of broken glass, old spoons, animal bone, production waste from metalworking, perhaps, middens of shells, leftovers from food preparation. Coins, things that are lost accidentally. We're also interested in those. And we're also interested in things that are actually put into the ground intentionally. Things like hordes, hordes of Viking hack silver, hordes of Roman coins, hordes of Anglo-Saxon gold, hordes of Bronze Age axe heads, and also, of course, human burials. Tombs, mausolea. These are all things that we're interested in. We're also interested in entire landscapes. We're interested in the layers of meaning that people put over these landscapes, the way in which we create ancestral landscapes, special places, dangerous places, holy places. We're interested in how people put meaning onto place. And we're also interested in how people physically alter the landscape. Like this enormous monument, quite mysterious monument, at Silbury Hill in Wiltshire. Has anyone been to see Silbury Hill? It's enormous. It's, it's so enormous when you see it up, up close. Um, and it really does alter the landscape. This landscape it would never be the same again. But also perhaps more mundane things like roads, trackways, pathways, the way in which people move through the landscape. 
And on an even bigger level, we're interested in the environment. We're even interested in the planetary environment. Archaeologists are becoming increasingly interested in climate change in the past, as well as in the present. We're interested in pollution, Roman lead pollution, the production of lead actually leaves a year-by-year -year trace in ice cores that we can extract from Greenland. And it shows annual fluctuations in years of plague, for instance, the growing Roman economy, the shrinking Roman economy. This is all seen in Greenland. Astonishing. There's some examples of what we're interested in. And where does archaeology happen? Well, the most typical thing that you'll probably be familiar with is archaeology happens in trenches in excavations. It's a nice example of this. This is the Westgate Centre in Oxford that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, it was built in 2016, 2017, um, but before that took place there was an archaeological excavation. The company that I used to work for, Oxford Archaeology, um, excavated the site between 2015 and 2016. Discovered the traces of the Greyfriars Medieval Abbey. Sluice gates and little waterfronts of the Trill Mill Stream in that area. Archaeology happens outside universities. It happens in the commercial development sector. But it also takes place in universities. Research excavations, um, like our own that we run out of Appleton, near Cumnor, for our students on degree level courses. Um, before that, we used to excavate at Dorchester on Thames, excavating the Roman town that exists under the allotments there. Archaeology also takes place in the laboratory lab. This is Oxford University's carbon accelerator unit. This is what we use for radiocarbon dating. In laboratories, we cut ceramics so thinly that we can shine light through them and examine them with a microscope to see the mineral content, to see not only where that clay may have been sourced, but also what people might, might have added to it, like little crystals of sand for instance, to temper the clay. We also fire x-rays at metal and measure the energy that's reflected back to determine the metallurgical content of that metal, of copper, tin, zinc. And we also, of course, analyse DNA and all sorts of other things in laboratories. Perhaps slightly more unexpectedly, probably the majority of archaeology takes place in libraries reading old reports, reading theory, reading about methods. This is where we identify gaps in the archaeological knowledge and work out what we want to do next. And archaeology also takes place in the classroom. Teaching and learning is a really key part of all academic subjects, including archaeology. This is where we make new archaeologists for a start, um, and it's also where we demonstrate the key values of archaeology, like what I'm trying to do today. Um, it's where we rethink our own interpretations, actually. There's nothing that gets you thinking more about your area than when you have to tell other people about it. And this is one of the wonderful things, actually, of teaching mature students, is that you all bring different expertises into the classroom. I've had retired physiotherapists teach me about bone diseases. Um, I've had chemists explaining the finer details of isotopic analysis, and retired engineers and architects giving me their own theories on how a building might have looked when it was reconstructed. I think that's one of the really nice things of adult education, that we're all there together learning. And I think that's the thing, is that archaeology is all about learning. We learn in the trench, we learn in the library, we learn in the laboratory, and we learn in the classroom. Um, it can take place anywhere. It's always nice hearing the reports from our online students from all over the world who learn archaeology in their lunch breaks or on the train home. It's extraordinary. And how do we do archaeology? What are the methods? Well, I think a good description of, ar of archaeology is that it's a magpie discipline. We've borrowed or perhaps stolen methods from all other disciplines, from the natural sciences, from the social sciences, from the arts and humanities. Um, for instance, if you're investigating a past environment, you'll need some knowledge of botany. You'll need some knowledge of climate science. If you're looking at the organic traces of foodstuffs on ceramics, for instance, you might need some knowledge of biochemistry. 
And if you're assessing ratios of radioactive carbon in organic materials to date something, you might also benefit from some knowledge of physics or atomic physics. But archaeology is also a discipline of practical and more applied knowledge. So it takes skill to excavate a Roman ditch. It takes even more skill to excavate a sequence of medieval buildings in a town where the latest building might actually be cut through all the earlier buildings. So you have this, these complex matrices of intersecting features. It takes very practical and sort of spatial, refined spatial awareness to understand that. You also need a refined spatial awareness to perform a topographic survey. This is some of our students here who are learning how to do a survey using GPS with one of our tutors. Or perhaps you might be an experimental archaeologist and you know everything about pottery, making pottery, or textile production, or even the production of food and drink, perhaps. Perhaps you might be more inclined towards sociology and the statistical analysis, testing whether our evidence can really demonstrate a particular theory. Or you might be inclined more towards anthropology. You might be interested in what late 19th century indigenous communities in the Pacific can tell us about the gifting of jewels or swords between Anglo-Saxon kings and princes. Or perhaps you'd be more inclined to a comfy armchair, pondering how perhaps John Paul Sartre's existentialism might contribute to our understanding of Upper Paleolithic cave painting. This is all archaeology. You don't have to know about all of these things but I expect everybody in this room will find some sort of interest in at least one of those areas. Archaeology is a very welcoming discipline for people from all different walks of life. And it's also all about collaboration. You can't really do an archaeological project by yourself because no one can have all this knowledge. We work together. And why? Why do we bother to do all this? These are small, about this big or so, quartz sandstone sculptures from a place called Lipinski Vir in Serbia. And they were made around the Mesolithic to Neolithic transition. So that's a period when hunter-gatherers begin to farm. It's about eight, 9,000 years ago in this part of the world. These little sculptures are carved out of river stones, this river sandstone, and they're all very individualistic and they're placed in the dwellings of these people. These people live around these objects. And we look at them and we think, well, are they humans or are they perhaps fish? These were people who fished. These are objects taken from, these are stones taken from rivers. Are they mythical beings? Are they gods? Are they ancestors? Are they simply decorative? They don't look expressions. very happy, do they? No, they're not. You know, they're, they're, not, they're slightly unsettling, I think, these things. They are slightly unsettling. and um, they, they kind of remind me what archaeology is all about. And what a peculiarly human habit it is to create objects that do instill this sense of unease and perhaps beauty as well, that, that baffle the outsider, that can make almost no sense to us but would have made complete sense at the time, how unique human societies are. And it's these creative <coughs> actions that connect people, that create what we call human society. And they do this it's exactly the same in the Neolithic and the Mesolithic as it is in Oxford today. We do things that don't make sense to outsiders all the time. And that's partly what archaeology is about, is reaching across that divide and understanding people and places that are quite different from us. And I think to understand this deep human past, to be curious about the deep human past, is in itself a very deeply human thing to do. We almost can't help it. We're driven toward knowledge. We're driven towards that knowledge of self and of others, and we always have been. Bearing all that in mind, is there a peculiarly archaeological way of looking at the world? Is there such a thing as an archaeological state of mind? Well, 
I think there probably is, and I'd try and characterise this for you. I think one of the main things that archaeology can contribute is an holistic perspective on human society. So we're rarely looking at just one aspect. We're usually trying to understand these societies as, as wholes. Um, and looking at this shared human past, I think, is a really important aspect for archaeologists. It reminds us that wherever we're from in time or in space, we're all on this planet together. And although people may well be doing very strange things in different places and different times, we're all, there's more that connects us, I think. Um, we're especially interested in human culture and human society. What people do when they get together, what people do when they form collectives, those creative um, actions that people make, how people become organised, how they structure their societies, the things that people create, both objects as well as ideas, and then how those creations go on to shape society. So let me, let me give you an example. I'm going to give you the example of flint napping. This is the creation of flint tools through chipping little bits off naturally occurring flints. It's the very oldest, or it's at least among the very oldest, of human technologies. We've been doing it for about three million years. That's before the evolution of the genus Homo. So here we're talking about Australopithecus, for instance, in Africa, potentially. What sorts of archaeological questions does this, does this sort of thing inspire? Well, fundamentally, as I, was, as I was saying earlier, it inspires ideas about material. So we look at this um, experimental archaeologist here, and he's got a piece of flint. He has a pebble, probably from a, from a river, which he's using as a percussive hammer stone on the flint, and he's also got a piece of leather. So archaeologists would look at that image and would go, right, where are these things from? Are they local? Are they from far away? Who's gathered them? Is everybody gathering these materials by themselves or in different times and places? Are particular people going out to get particular resources and bring them back? We might then also ask questions about knowledge and about skill. So how do people learn how to do this? Are they imitating each other? Is this something passed down generations? Is it a very specialist skill that only a few people have? Are there gradations in that skill between individuals? Almost certainly. And is there any form of labor division? Are just some people doing this? Or is this the sort of thing that everybody does? And of course, in different periods with lithic technologies, all of those aspects can change. But archaeologists are interesting in, interested in putting those things together in different places and understanding what that tells us about this whole society. We might go to an even deeper level of the intellect or consciousness and ask, well, at what point in evolution did people start doing this and why? When, for instance, this has become more of an incidental action of striking a rock and seeing what happens, when does it become an action in which an individual actually envisage, envisages the tool within the flint and then removes parts to reveal that tool? That's a really interesting question, I think. When do, when do people have that mental template? It's about imagination. It's about creativity. Once we've asked all those questions, we might start to ask, well, OK, so this is how people are changing and altering stones, flint, how are those flints then changing the people who are using them? That's the sort of second level questions. Because of course, as soon as people start making these things, um, it changes their society. They may be able to procure and prepare food more efficiently, for instance, perhaps most obviously. That is actually a, a substantial change. That's why people are perhaps doing this most fundamentally. Um, but also, once you start doing this, you start to create inequalities, inequalities of people with different materials in different places, people with different levels of skill. Um, you might also start creating differences within these social groups of, of who is doing this, who is able to do this. So these objects start to make society more complex. And we can think of that with flints, but we could also equally well apply that to the modern world and think about how buildings change our lives, change how we interact, how cities change how we interact. interact how computers 
and the transfer of knowledge rapidly across the world. These are all not so far away from the archaeological discipline. And they're all getting towards these much sort of bigger ideas of politics, of economics. And previously, I was with these little sculptures, I'm talking about religion and belief and ritual, perhaps, as well. And so these are the sort of higher level topics that we tend to talk about. Now, I did say that archaeology wasn't all about adventure and discovery. But that was a bit of an exaggeration. Um, it was a bit of a trick to trick you into thinking that I was an entirely sober and serious scientist or intellectual. Um, I'm not. Discovery is actually a really important part of archaeology, I think. Um, uncovering a grave, uncovering even a new site report in the library. Perhaps for some people it's clicking the execute button on a computer program that will do a statistic analysis for you and watching the results pour across the screen. Perhaps for someone like Howard Carter, and isn't it too terribly thrilled here in this picture, I don't think, um, in 1923, peeping through a hole in the door of Tutankhamun's tomb to announce that he saw wonderful things, last seen three, more than 3,000 years ago. That's, that's a profound idea, I think. I was excavating once on a hill fort in Romania, in the first century early 2nd century AD site, so during the Roman invasion of that area of the world. And I found the outline of a pit, and I dug down about a foot or so carefully with a trowel, and I found a vessel. And then I lifted that vessel out carefully, and there was another one, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one, all inside each other. And that is a thrilling moment. You know, that is a genuinely thrilling moment. What, it, what even does that mean? Why have these things been put there? I can't answer that question. And some of these discoveries are major, things like Tutankhamun's tomb, which went on not only to influence our understanding of Egypt, ancient Egypt, but also caused this wave of Egyptomania through the 1920s and the 1930s in Europe. Um, but even little things like a single Roman coin, like a single ceramic shirt of, of a ceramic vessel, incrementally add to our knowledge, add to our understanding of the past. All these little things do. And archaeologists thrive on this thrill. I think it sort of ignites, or maybe reignites, the imagination of the inner children that sort of led us all to pursue this quite strange career. One of the other things I think about archaeology that is truly th thrilling is the human connection that we receive through archaeology. And that, of course, comes from the fact that we look at materials, that we look at physical objects, remainders of the past itself. Now, what you're looking at here, a series of little indentations in the silt, um, in a place that I'm told is pronounced Haysborough in Norfolk. Um, there's about 50 footprints. And these 50 footprints were made approximately 800,000 years ago. Probably by one of our ancestors, a species called Homo antecessor. Now, after they'd been revealed naturally by the tide, they disappeared within two weeks. But in that interim, they'd been 3D scanned. Hopefully you can sort of see these little red dots in that image. It's a little small, isn't it, the screen? Um, and analysis of these footprints identified about five or six individuals. From the size of the footprints, probably a mixture of males and females and children. And they didn't appear to be doing anything. They just appeared to be milling around on the mudflats, which in some ways is an even more sort of um, relatable thing to be doing. Then they moved away somewhere else, and a layer of sand was laid down over this by the tide, and then a layer of silt, and then a layer of sand, and they were preserved in that way. But what an intimate connection that is to the past, to see the, <coughs> the indentations of feet. All of this, I think, gives archaeologists a very um, bottom-up view of the past. Uh, we do get very close to the individual lives of women, children, and men. Um, 
closer often, I think, than we do from written sources, from, from historical literature. I think it's quite profound in the way in which these ancient individuals are almost present in our excavation trenches, as they almost are on this beach. Um, they're almost present in our finds trays when we hand them over for analysis, and they're literally present when we're analysing their bones in a laboratory. Um, time is a great leveller. Everyone's bones look the same at the end of the day. Um, and in that sense, a shirt of pottery in the right place can be far more valuable than a gold coin when it comes to an archaeological view of the world. It entirely depends on where those things are found. We are an idealistic and democratic subject, I like to think. And talking of unexpected directions, this is an exhibition that is on currently in the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford. Some of you may well have been to see this already. Um, it's this intimacy and this directness of archaeology that can lead to unexpected projects like this. Um, this is the archaeology of the contemporary world. So if I'm talking about an archaeological state of mind, how do archaeologists look at how we all interact and the things that we do? Now, in 2016, as I'm sure you're all familiar, the Calais jungle um, was demolished violently, displacing about 10,000 people who had made this place their temporary home. Archaeologists, artists, and various volunteers, um, as well as refugees who are present here, um, before and after its destruction, gathered certain materials, gathered images, gathered everyday objects. And they, this was brought, some of these things were brought together for this exhibition. And this is essentially an archaeological view, an archaeological image of this modern and this ongoing tragedy. Um, this is archaeology, but it's not ancient. But it is telling us something different, I think, from news reports, from radio and television documentaries. It's telling us something quite intimate about the lives of ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances. The violence they suffer and the role of objects and images in their lives and in their experiences. And for that reason, it is quite a moving thing to, to go to this exhibition, I think. And perhaps it does help us to come to terms with and to understand um, the very human, very individual um, consequences of global political and economic events. So, what is the purpose then of the humble archaeologist in the contemporary world? Well, as an idealist, I think archaeology is crucial. And as I've also said, I think archaeology is virtually inevitable. We're driven towards it for reasons we don't always understand. Now, as a believer in the ideals of the Enlightenment, I do believe in the value of knowledge for its own sake. Um, I think to learn about the past is simply enjoyable, and all learning, all knowledge, is in some way collective or individual progress. I believe this strongly. But I also believe in the intellectual endeavour of archaeology, um, that we'll never be able to reconstruct that past perfectly. So we have to weigh up different kinds of evidence. We have to critically appraise theory. We have to use knowledge from all these different, er all these different disciplines. And these sort of critical thinking, these, th these sorts of skills, are actually very useful for all of us, I think. They, they, it's the sort of thing we do in our everyday lives all the time, this weighing up of evidence. And archaeologists do that all the time, as do many other academic disciplines, but we're, we're among them. Now, perhaps the grandest ideal that I have for archaeology is that archaeology provides feelings of belonging accept and acceptance. Um, it provides some sort of form of responsible citizenship in the world. For instance, local or community archaeology projects, things that happen in people's own back gardens in their own towns or villages. These, this increase of knowledge in people's local area um, increases their sense of belonging to that place. It increases their sense of responsibility towards that place and everybody else who lives there. Um, and, and their collective heritage. And the same applies, in fact, to learning about places where other people live in different periods and at different times. 
It teaches us how to understand each other, no matter the social or cultural gaps that are between us. It increases this idea of a shared human existence and a shared human past that I've talked about a few times this afternoon. Now, these are all very good things, I think, and I hope that you agree with at least some of those things. And that's where I'm going to leave my formal talk. And now I'd like to talk about how you get started on archaeology with, with our department. So if, you, if you'd like to leave now, you're perfectly welcome to. I know you've had a very long day. But if you'd like to find out a little bit more about the courses that we do, then I'll give you a very brief overview, and then I'll remain here to answer any questions you might have. But thank you very much for listening. Thank you.